So um, uh, many of you know we have a, um, uh, we don't have, but there is a, a preschool that uses uh, some of our space next door in the education building. Um, and uh, they, they have several facilities uh, in this community, uh, in, in this area. Um, but uh, they use our building for the youngest group of, of kids, uh, people who are um, starting out at about 18 months and going up to about two and a half years. So that, that year of toddlerness um, is, the, is the kids who are mostly over here. And um, uh, we don't have anything to do with them. They're, you know, it's a separate uh, organization. Uh, all they do is uh, use our space. But, um, but I see them, and especially I hear them. Uh, because my office is is in the education building, and um, and mostly when I I hear them when uh, they are being dropped off by their parents, um, because they don't they don't seem to care for that, um, and <laughs> and in particular uh, they don't like it when they are first uh, coming here. So they're 15 or you know whatever they're 18 months old, and it's time for them to uh, go to preschool, and uh, they they get dropped off, and then um, there's wailing and gnashing of baby teeth. So, um, so um, I hear it, and, and I hear it very, very much for a couple of days, and then they get the hang of it. But you know what? I don't fault the kids, right? Uh, I, I would feel the same way, and, and so would you. If you were a toddler, you know, picture it. You're, you're a toddler, and um, you know, here's this person, you know, your parent, and uh, they are the center of your universe. You've known them all your life, literally all your life you've known them, and, um, and uh, one day they put you in the little car seat and they drive you to some strange place and they put you in a room full of strangers and then they leave. <laughs> How would you feel about that? You know, are they ever going to come back? You have no idea, right? Um, you, you barely understand language, right? You're still working on a lot of these things. And so, so they might have made assurances, but you know, do you believe them? And in the meantime, what about all these strangers? Are they gonna kill you in the meantime, right? You know, it's, it's a perfectly reasonable thing for these toddlers to be frightened and to be very unhappy about it. So, so yes, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of crying uh, that first couple of days. And um, I don't blame them for being suspicious. You know, that's the way it is, right? We start out with that, that kind of, you know, whatever the, the uh, um, our, our family, or really our parents. And, you know, we're, we're the very center of the universe, but then around that maybe are the parents. And then, you know, maybe, maybe if we're the eldest child or, you know, older, there might come a second child or something like that. And, you know, we're, we're suspicious of them, but over time we might let them in that circle, right? So, so now the circle's grown a little bit. And then, you know, maybe there's grandparents or cousins and the circle gets a little bit bigger. And then maybe there's, there's friends from play dates or something like that. But, but our circles grow, right? We start small and we grow. And really it's the work of a lifetime to, to learn to include people in, in bigger and bigger circles. That, that that's really the way, the way that um, we work as people. That's just kind of natural for us. So we, we start with, um, we, we have suspicious minds and it's, it's, it's our... Um, it's an effort to be less suspicious of people we don't know over time. So um, that's kind of the way we're made. 30 years ago, um, last month, I was planning uh, last month, um, uh, Rodney King asked this question. He said, can we all get along? Can we all get along? This was in the wake of the LA riots from 1992. Many of you remember that. and. Um, he asked that question because, because for the last several days at that point, um, people had not been get, go, getting along. Um, there was tremendous destruction. There was uh, 63 people died, about 2,400 people uh, were injured, and there was over a billion dollars worth of property damage. The National Guard had to be called in, and uh, Rodney King went on television because uh, he, his, his um, story was tied up with the, the riots. Um, it was the... Um, uh, he had been beaten by the uh, L.A. police, or four people in the L.A. police, and um, a, a trial had occurred in April that, um, that uh, uh, exonerated the, or, or failed to convict the, the four policemen who had beaten him. And so that sparked the, the riot that followed. And um, so after, after um, several days of rioting, he was on television and he said, can we all get along? Can we all get along? That's a, that's a good question. I sometimes wonder if we can get along. Um, uh, five years later, Rodney King was um, asked how things were 
and he said that the situation, at least with the police, had gotten better. Um, that that uh, that at least in the case of the police, that things had gotten better. But um, um, Rodney King died um, ten years ago this week, and I wonder if we could ask him today if he would still say that. I wonder how he would evaluate our progress at getting along with one another. Sometimes I wonder. You know, I. I have the same social media you have, I have the same TV, the same newspapers, and I wonder, you know, when you think about all of the, all of the conflicts that, that we have in our society, the, the, the differences between people that have become uh, not simply uh, differences to celebrate, but, but uh, distinctions uh, to draw between people. When you think about things like race, um, uh, race and ethnicities, can, can different uh, ethnicities and races get along? Can we? How about immigrants and native-born citizens? Can we get along? How about people with different politics? Can, can red states get along with blue states? Can red cities get along with blue cities? Can capitalists get along with socialists? Can labor get along with management? Can the rich get along with the poor? Can the old get along with the young? Can people with different sexual um, uh, expressions get along with each other? Can men and women get along? Can we get along? And there are reasons to be discouraged because, because, um, because in so many ways, uh, we are divided from one another. And when I think about those toddlers and their natural suspicion of other people, I wonder, should we? Is, is there a limit? You know, we get along with you know, our family and maybe some relatives, but should we get along with other people? Should we get along with people who are different with us? And, and if so, why? Why should we get along with each other? Is there some limit? How, how far out can that circle grow? Is there like a, some, some natural limit to how far that circle can expand before, no, we can't get along? For the Apostle Paul, the answer was yes. Paul wrote the, the passage we heard a moment ago. He, he um, was a leader in the uh, church, the Christian church, uh, in the middle of the first century. So he was uh, writing um, about 20 years after the time that, that uh, Jesus was raised. And Paul wrote this letter to a church in Rome, to, to the, the group of Christians that was gathered in Rome. And, <coughs> and that letter was preserved by that church and it, they made copies of it and they circulated it. And over the years, it became um, included in, in the group of documents that, that came to be known as the New Testament. So, so Paul wrote this letter saying, yes, we can get along. And, um, and that was something that Paul wouldn't have expected to be the case. In fact, pretty much anybody in the first century, pretty much nobody would have said we could have gotten along. If, if you talk to 100 people, they would have all said, no, of course you can't get along with everybody. That, that that's just natural. Um, and they might have added, what are you stupid? Because, because it was blindingly obvious to people that no, of course we can't get along. The ancient Greeks uh, uh, came up with the word barbarian um, because, because it meant people who don't speak Greek. Um, the, 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 it was their, their word for saying, you know, we would say blah, 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 they said bar, bar, bar. When, when they heard somebody you know, yammering along and they didn't understand what he was saying, they'd say, well, that's a barbarian, he doesn't speak Greek. But it's such a useful word that it came to be adopted by all kinds of cultures that, that, you know, I don't like Greeks, but they came up with a good word there. So barbarians. So barbarians, they are the people beyond that outer limit, right? There's, there's my family, and there's my clan, and there's my tribe, and there's my nation. And outside that, well, that's barbarians. There is a limit, and I can get along with these people. The, there's, a, there's an ancient Bedouin um, proverb that goes like this. 
me uh, and against my brother, my brother and I against our cousin and all of us against the stranger. That would have been the natural way people thought in the first century. Um, that, that, that's just the way things work. There are these circles that expand outward and we have the greatest trust for the people uh, closest to us, uh, but we would unite in order to repel somebody who is further out. That was the way people thought in the first century, and honestly, it's the way a lot of people think today. Um, Henry Kissinger famously said that nations don't have friends, they only have interests, which is great as long as your interests align. But if your interests stop aligning, then what? Well, I guess we can't get along anymore. And that was the, the mindset in the world that Paul wrote this letter to. They would have said, yeah, you can get along with some people, but I mean, ultimately, the only person you can be sure to get along with is yourself. You can get along with your brother a little bit, your cousin somewhat less, and the stranger, not at all. The people beyond that outer circle, the people beyond my, my tribe or my nation, they're barbarians. I can't, and for that matter, why should I get along with them? And Paul writes this letter to say, Actually, I think you can. Paul begins his letter by saying, or this passage of the letter, he says, but now, he says, he says I, I, I get that, right? Of course, why would you? You know, this is ancient wisdom. We all know you can't get along. But he says, something has changed. But now, something is different. What was true before is no longer true because now, God's righteousness has been revealed apart from the law, which is confirmed by the law and the prophets. What does he mean by that? Well, there is, there is a lot to unpack in that, in that um, verse. It's helpful to remember that Paul was a Pharisee. He was a member of one of various groups within the greater world of Judaism. So he was a Pharisee, which was, which was a sect, and they were probably the strictest set, sect <laughs> among the Jews. There were other sects. There were Sadducees and, and Essenes and so forth, Zealots. So there were different groups among the Jews. But Paul would have said, okay, well, here's the thing, right? I'm, I'm a, a Pharisee. I'm, um, uh, I'm of the, the tribe of uh, Benjamin, I think. So Paul would have said, I have these, these characteristics. I'm, I'm part of these circles. I'm included in these circles. But the limit as a Jew is the law. The law defines what it means to be a Jew. And, and beyond that, there's Gentiles, so there's Jews. And within this circle, we can talk about what kind of Jew. We can talk about, we can talk about are you a, a Pharisee or an Essene or a Sadducee? We can talk about that. We can talk about whether you're a good Jew or a bad Jew. We can talk about uh, all kinds of things within that circle. But outside that circle, they're all Gentiles. And so Paul says that was the perimeter, that, that that's, that's the perimeter that I as a Jew, Jew would have understood. That outer boundary is the law. So he says, now God's righteousness has been revealed apart from the law, beyond the law, that the law doesn't function anymore as the boundary between, between um, the righteous and the unrighteous. So what does he mean by righteous? Well, uh, we have all kinds of connotations for righteous. Uh, those of us in the 70s may remember it was a slang word for a while. But, um, but uh, righteous simply means right with God. It means, we would say, not guilty. That, uh, not, not guilty um, like those policemen um, uh, in the Rodney King uh, affair. It doesn't mean that they didn't do anything wrong, but it means that they have been declared not guilty. And in the case of a human jury, that can be an error. But this is God declaring them not guilty. God is declaring them right. God saying, I don't have any complaint against you. You are right with me. So that's what Paul means, that we are right with God. And Paul says, Jews, of course, are right with God. And Gentiles aren't until now. That Jews and Gentiles are right with God. This is an amazing thing that has happened, that that perimeter no longer defines who is good with God and who is not. So he says, now God's righteousness had been revealed apart from the law, which is confirmed by the law and the prophets. What does he mean by that? <coughs> he means that, um, 
that, uh, that uh, this is confirmed within the law. This is something the law anticipated. And um, uh, there doesn't seem to be a slide, but, but he's referring to the, the self-understanding of the Jews, that, that from the time of, of the, the patriarchs, the, the ancestors of the Jews, this was their understanding. The, um, the, um, the patriarch um, Abraham, God spoke to him and said, I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you. God said, I'm going to establish that community, that, this covenant community that will become the nation of Israel. Uh, Israel hasn't been born yet, but God promises to Abraham that there will be a nation that comes from your offspring. I'm going to make a great nation of you and I will make your name respected and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and those who curse you I will curse. All the families of earth will be blessed because of you. God promises that he will make a community from the, the descendants of Abraham and God will use that community to bless the whole world. Paul says that's what God was always up to. This was always the plan. And he, he's talking about the law and the prophets. So he's, he's referring to the way that the, um, um, when, when uh, they didn't have the law at the time of um, Abraham, but when God gave the people the law at the time of the Exodus, God spoke to Moses and uh, gave them the law. He said, I'm going to give you a promised land, the, the land of promise, and I'm going to give you a law. And it, th those two things will bind you together as a nation. So you will be the nation that can then fulfill your destiny to bless all the world. So God tells, um, um, Moses wrote down all the Lord, Lord's words. Then he took the covenant scroll and read it out loud for the people to hear. And they responded, everything the Lord has said we will do and we will obey. We will obey the law of God. And that, that land and then the law combined to hold the community together. So what was the Hebrew people in Egypt became the nation of Israel when they arrived in the land of promise. And it functioned so well to unite the community that even when they left the land, when the, when the Babylonians conquered them and took them to Babylon, they were deported. It held them together even in a strange land. That law, that body of rules, what it meant to be a Jew, held them together. And when they were able to return to uh, the promised land, they continued to be held together by the law. And as they spread out across the Mediterranean world around the time of Christ, the law held them together. So Paul is saying that this, this um, is what God always intended, that he always intended there to be a nation through which he would bless the whole world. There would be a circle to bless the people outside the circle. Paul is saying that that has now been revealed. The thing that God was always um, doing <coughs> has now been revealed. <coughs> so if you are a first century Jew or really a first century anybody, you might say, okay, well, where is that? Where is that? You, you, you're saying God has extended um, the, uh, the, the boundary. Where is the boundary now? So it used to be, I used to know. It was Torah, it was the law. Where is it now? And Paul says, God's not righteousness comes through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ for all who have faith in him. He says, that's the boundary. There's no more distinction between Jew and Gentile. All who have faith in him are righteous, are set right with God. So God has extended his righteousness. And the reason he can do that is because it's his righteousness. He's the one who's making these decisions. Um, yes, I have no beef with you. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with you. That, that because of what Jesus has done, there's no problems between us, at least on God's end. So God has extended his righteousness. And <coughs> Paul continues. He says, all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. Now, this may be a callback to chapter 2. He spent some time in chapter 2 saying that Jews sin too. See, he's anticipating the argument. The argument is, look, how could, how could God possibly be right with people out there? How could God be right with them? Because they're sinners. And Paul is saying, yeah, but you know, so are we. He says, he says, all have sinned. And maybe he's referring to the argument he made in chapter 2 where he talked about the way that, that Jews fail to obey the law so they sin just like Gentiles, and then on top of that, they know better because they have God's law. So that's the argument he made in chapter 2. So maybe he's referring to that, but maybe he's looking ahead to the argument he'll make in chapter 5, where he says, we all have the same ancestor. 
The Jews are children of Abraham, but everyone is a child of Adam. So either way, he's saying, and, and Adam, Adam, of course, uh, fell from grace when he sinned. So <laughs> whichever it is he has in mind, he's saying one way or the other, we have all sinned. So it's not like they are the sinners and we are not. He says, all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. But all are treated as righteous. All are set right with God. And then, you know, I don't know if you're the kind of person who circles things in your Bible. I, I've never been able to do that, you know. So I, I print it out on my computer and then circle it there. But if you are a, if you are a, a Bible verse circular, cir circular um, Romans 3.24 is a great verse to circle. It's an amazing verse with all kinds of stuff in it. I want to take a moment to unpack it. He, he, he says, all are treated as righteous. So all are treated as righteous freely by His grace. What does he mean by that? He means that nobody can force God to do anything. This is something God has chosen to do. It, no one has any leverage over God. So um, God <laughs> does this freely because no one has leverage over Him. And He does it by grace. By grace. Grace means unmerited favor. It means I, I don't like you because of what you do. I like you because of who you are. I just like you. That's what grace means. I, I favor you. I, I have favor for you. And he says, God already has favor for us. It's not because of the things we do, the, whether we obey the law or not. Um, he says, we, j God extends his righteousness freely by grace because God favors us already. And how did this happen? It happens because of Christ. He says, um, it comes... Uh, all are treated as righteous because of a ransom that was paid by Christ. So freely no one has leverage over God. Grace, God favors us already. And it becomes, it's because of Christ who pays a ransom, who changes our status. And Paul's using two different images here and in the next verse. He says, he says the first one would have been familiar to people in the first century. Pretty much any culture would have understood it. Uh, it's the idea of redeeming somebody from slavery. In the ancient world, if you ran out of money, you know, if, if your debts exceeded your assets, then guess what the next asset was? It was you. You know, it was your family and it was you. And they got sold too. And so uh, you were then a slave. Somebody else got you as, as the, the way to settle that debt. And if they really wanted money, then what they could do is they could sell you. And if you had relatives or anybody you could, you could call on, then they could redeem you. They could pay that, that price and uh, they'd technically own you, but if they're a friend or a relative or something, they might let you off. So uh, someone has changed your status. You are legally a, a slave until somebody redeems you. So, so they would have understood this. It also happened in times of war. If you captured, a, you know, you're an army and you capture a town, you know, the, the soldiers, the citizens, you know, er, everybody in that town, you know, the, the dogs and cats, everybody is now your loot. And you monetize that by selling them as slaves. So um, uh, the way that the, the nation who you were fighting could get them back is by paying um, a ransom for them. So Paul is saying, he's, Jesus has paid our ransom. So that's one picture Paul uses. He says, all are treated as righteous freely by his grace because of a ransom that was paid by Jesus Christ. But then he, he immediately uses a different picture. He says, through his faithfulness, God displayed Jesus as the place of sacrifice where the mercy is found. <laughs> He's using a word here um, that in older translations was translated as atonement. That, that Jesus was the, the, the mercy seat. The, the lid of the Ark of the Covenant was the mercy seat. Jesus was the atonement. That he, he starts using sacrificial language. And this, this reminds the people within the circle, hey, we, we're sinners. And God, within the law, has provided a means of dealing with our sin. He provided the sacrificial system. And the nature of the sacrificial system is it's always going to require blood. And he says, and the blood that God has provided is the blood of his son. Jesus gave himself as a sacrifice. So as a, as a ransom to, to redeem us and as a sacrifice to deal with our sin. So he says... <clears throat> He did this to demonstrate his righteousness. God can do this. God is not changing the rules. God is operating within the rules. God is not saying, well, I gave you the law, but forget the law. I've come up with something better. He's saying God is working within the law. The, the reason he could use the sacrificial system is because you've always had the sacrificial system as long as there's been a law. 
And he says, he did this to demonstrate his righteousness in passing over sins that happened before. All the sins that you've been using the law, the, the sacrificial system to cover over in the past, that system, he did it to demonstrate um, that he is righteous in the present time as well and to treat the one who has faith in Jesus as righteous. So that's the argument that Paul is making. How, how can God do this? I mean, you know, yes, it's his, it's his righteousness. He can do what he wants with it. But God is being righteous in doing so. He, he hasn't done anything wrong in all this. So what then happens to our bragging? You know, we have this national pride. We have been kicked and beaten. We've been deported. We've been treated like Jews have always been treated. But we were a nation. We were the apple of God's eye. What happens to our bragging? If you dissolve that boundary, if you make that porous, then what? What happens to our bragging? Paul says it's thrown out. With which law? With what has we've accomplished under the law? And he says, no, no, not at all. Uh, Paul, Paul, later in this letter, Paul will talk about that the Jews continue as a nation. But he says, there is now the law of faith. We consider that a person is treated as righteous by faith apart from what is accomplished under the law, that the law is no longer the boundary. You're treated as, as um, righteous by faith. So, our third point, whoop. All with faith belong to the covenant community. That there is a new boundary, those with faith. So, all with faith belong to the covenant community. And then he... He's going to spend chapter 4 talking about this in great detail, and we're not going to look at that, because he, he closes out this section by reminding them of the big idea. The big idea is that Israel was blessed to be a blessing. And so he says, is, is God the God of Jews only? And there's a tension that Paul is explo exploiting to make this argument. Um, every Jew, then and now, would have been... Uh, very familiar with a prayer called the Shema. It comes from Deuteronomy 6.4, and it goes like this. It says, uh, listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And there is a tension, and it says the Lord's our God, but there's only one God. The Lord is God, the Lord is one. And Paul says, is God the God of Jews only? I mean, yes, he's the God of Jews, for sure. But is he the God of Jews only? Isn't God the God of Gentiles also? The answer is, of course he is. Of course he is. So he says, since God is one, then the one who makes the circumcised righteous by faith, the ones who make Jews, the one who makes Jews righteous by faith, will also make those who are not circumcised righteous through faith. Those outside the law, God will make righteous by faith. So that is Paul's argument. He says, of course, we all exist in these circles. It's the most natural thing in the world, but something new has happened. Jesus has ransomed us. Jesus has given himself as a sacrifice so that all with faith are set right with God. So, can we get along? Can we? I don't know. That remains to be seen. Paul says lines don't help. Lines don't help us get along. <clears throat> Providentially, this week I saw this in the Babylon Bee. It says, Christian picky about who he shares the gospel with since he might have to spend eternity with them. <laughs> If, if the new boundary, the old boundary was the law, and if the new boundary is those who have faith in Christ, who are they? How could we possibly draw that line? How do we know if somebody has faith? You know, we're in a church meeting here to, today. Those of you online, um, do you have faith? Do I have faith? How do you know? You, you can't know. You can't know who has faith. You have to assume that anybody you meet 
has faith, or if they don't now, might someday. There's no way for us to draw that line. There may be a line. Paul says that the, the line is faith in Jesus. But how could we possibly draw that line? There's no way to know who it is. And so we can be picky about who we share the gospel with. But that's, to do so is to miss the point. I think if, 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 um, if you were to draw a line, Paul would probably say, well, if you start drawing lines, then know this, you're on the wrong side of it. Except I think Paul would also say, but who knows? People change. Look at me. So, can we get along? I don't know. But the church bears witness to unbelievers that, that if, if that line exists, and we can't see it, but if there is a line someplace, then people with faith are right with God. And we don't know who they are. We don't know who they will be. And we might think to ourselves, well, then somehow it's on me to bring people to faith. And let me assure you, no, it's not. That is way above your pay grade. <laughs> There's only one person who can bring someone to faith, and that's the Holy Spirit. Only the Holy Spirit can work in somebody's heart so that they come to faith. We can't do that. But the church can bear witness to unbelievers. The way we do that is we bring people to God. Sometimes that means bringing them to church. But often, they're not interested in coming to church because they're unbelievers. And so what do you do? Well, you bring them to God in prayer. You say, Lord, I don't know. I can't judge somebody's heart, but you can. So I pray, Lord, that you would bless them with faith. If they have faith, reignite it. And if they don't, give it to them. We can bring people to God, but we can also bring God to people. In, in what the church does, the, the acts of mercy we do, um, the, the, the witness we make in the world, we are bringing God to people. And probably the most important way we can bring God to people, at least in this area, is by assuming that they are inside that boundary, that they are not barbarians, by treating them like people that God favors. Not because they're inside our circle, not because they're like us, not because they're, they're closely related to us, but because we follow a risen Lord who died and rose again so that he could extend God's circle. Let's pray. Loving God, this world is so filled with divisions and it's natural for us to circle the wagons, to erect walls and barriers between us and, and those people, those people who aren't like us, those people we're suspicious of. Help us to remember always that Jesus died to expand your circle and that we will never meet anybody in this world that may not have faith. So help us to treat them as the people that you love, people who are right with you, we ask these things through Christ our Lord. Amen.